Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar, which we will discuss today about applicable transformer standards and their interpretations. However, before we get started, uh, quick housekeeping. We will uh, inform you about our email address, uh, my company email address, and also marketing email address where you can, after the webinar is over, you can email us requesting uh, uh, the copy of the webinar and also the, the certifications from our company. Having said that, as always, I'm going to start with safety. And this next safety moment is related to what I actually had to have. Uh, I had happened to me this over the weekend. It's spring pollen allergy season. So if, you, if you're living in a very high pollen area, and the time of the year is there where you have a lot of pollen and you'll be working outside long periods of time, please wear a mask or even goggles if it's windy because that's exactly what happened to me and I had I had stuff getting in my eyes and uh, I spent uh, Sunday pretty much my eyes closed. So I just wanted to share that experience with you so it doesn't happen to, to, to anyone. Having said that, I will get started on our webinar today. Agenda. I'm going to be talking about what are the IEEE standards and why do we have them? Why do we have to have them? And how is the IEEE Transformers Committee structured? And we're going to review some of the standards and how to interpret them. And of course, uh, for copyright policies, I cannot open the standards or I cannot share any of the standards with anyone. Uh, if anyone wants to get a copy of these standards, of course, you can go to IEEE Transformers Community website or IEEE's website, and uh, it's very clear in the uh, in the website how to purchase any of these standards or all of it if you if you want to. What is the IEEE Transformers Committee? The IEEE Transformers Committee is one of the largest and most active of the 17 technical committees within the IEEE Power and Energy Society, PES. The committee is com uh, comprised of technical and managerial representatives from manufacturers, consultants, vendors, and end users of electrical transformers and components. The continuing scope of the committee is to develop and update the standards and guidelines for the design testing, repair, installation, operation, and maintenance of the transformers, reactors, and associated components that are used within electric utility and industrial power systems. And I personally chair a couple working groups and task force, as well as so many other colleagues that we have. It is, it is a committee that we actually work pretty hard to update, keep our standards updated, our guidelines updated, uh, we get together twice a year and we review the standards and any updates that's needed uh, and even some of the standards which may be old and needs to be reviewed, we open those up, we review them, update if needed, and so on and so forth. So it is a working uh, committee uh, with these responsibilities that I just mentioned. Within IEEE Transformers Committee, we have these subcommittees under that. And you can imagine, and I'll actually, I picked four or five of these uh, to show you how it is all structured and within that, how and where you can find these applicable standards. So, of course, we're not going to talk much about the administrative portion, but there is subcommittees for bushings, dielectric test, distribution transformers, dry type transformers, transformers and reactors for high voltage DC applications, instrument transformers, insulating fluids, insulation life, and of course meetings planning, performance characteristics, power transformers, overall standards, subsurface transformers and network protectors. So if we if we think about a tree and try to bring the branches under the tree, these are all the subcommittees that the high level and underneath you will see the children committees, working groups, text verses under these. With that said, let's start with bushing committee. What is the scope of the bushing subcommittee? The bushing subcommittee 
scope is to study and review engineering aspects of outdoor apparatus bushings having BIL of 110 kV or above. And of course, BIL stands for basic insulation level and used as components of power transformers, reactors, and all circuit breakers. This bushing subcommittee scope is to develop and maintain related standards and recommended practices and guides for such products. Standards, recommended practices, and guides for such product coordinate with other technical committees, groups, and societies, and associates as required. That is the, 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 the the final two, three high level bullet points here kind of applies to almost all subcommittees. So, Bushing subcommittee works for Bushings and apparatus 110 kVBL and above. Now, let's see what is under the subcommittee. I'm going to go back and then forward again. If we go back, now we are looking at Bushing subcommittee. If anyone has any interest in looking at where are my standards related to my bushings? Then you can look, start looking, okay, bushing subcommittee. Then now we pass the scope. Now under the bushing subcommittee, you will have, and by the way, I might not have had all of the children groups underneath here because there may be more, but I selected some of the main ones. So under bushing subcommittee, C57.19.00, it's a working group. Okay, so now you have the parent subcommittee, Bushing subcommittee, and under that, the children, we call it that way, the working groups or task forces. So we have C57.19.00, working group, and that working group with members or guests and or guests, they get together twice a year or more because there are some standards that we may have to work more than just twice a year and we can actually schedule meetings, offline meetings, off meeting meetings, uh, where we can actually discuss to continue to get the work done. Because there are timelines, whenever we are working on a standard, as long as it's not a continuous, which you will, you will see when I talk about uh, C57 to F90, for example, there's several C57 to F90s, but the one that I actually chair, continuous revision, is, is a continuous one. But a lot of other working groups and task forces will have timelines because we have certain time to update or revise the standard and give it back to the subcommittee where they can incorporate it with the standard subcommittee and, and release the new revised standard. So 1900 works on standard general requirements and test procedures for power apparatus bushings. 1901 works on standard performance characteristics and dimensions for outdoor apparatus bushings. 02 works on standard for the design and performance requirements of bushings applied to liquid <coughs> immersed distribution transformers. As I said at the beginning, I cannot open these because of copyright policies, but if anybody wants to really look at what, where can you, where can I find the performance requirement of a bushing for liquid immersed transformer, then you will have to go find C57-1202, uh, now excuse me, 1902, and that's where you'll be able to find the performance requirements. Under 1904, you will be able to find the performance characteristics and dimensions for high current power transformer bushings. Okay, so bushings that are rated, say, more than two, three, four thousand amps. Working group 19100, Guide for Application of Power Apparatus Bushings. And one of the last ones is standard requirements, terminology, and test code for bushings for DC applications. So this type of example is where I'm going to speak about the other subcommittees as well. So started with bushings, and of course, I'm not, I am not going to have time to go through every one of them today, but the idea of today's webinar is to share with those of you who may not be familiar with how 
IEEE Transformers Committee works and where you can find these. That's my goal today to, to share this knowledge of how to find, and maybe we'll pick a couple of them to talk about where within these standards you can find, uh, you can find the information. Going into the next slide, let's take a uh, dielectric subcommittee, for example. So what does dielectrics mean? Is it just testing? Well, yes, and also there is the dielectric design criteria that we uh, the subcommittee covers. The scope of this subcommittee is to study and review engineering aspects of high voltage requirements for service conditions, and conversely, voltage tests that will be that will determine that service requirements are met for liquid fuel transformers and reactors. I'm not going to read the other two because this is common, and you can, if you get a copy of this presentation, you can always read that. But so let's. I want to reread this first. So study and review the engineering aspects of the test voltage requirements of service and uh, for service conditions, and also voltage tests. So voltage requirement and voltage voltage test is covered under the electric subcommittee. So with that said, that's the parent, okay? The electric subcommittee. Now, what are the children working groups or maybe even task force? So let's start with C5798, working group, IEEE guide, guide. So I want to talk about a little here. What is guide? What's the difference between guide versus standard? A guide is obviously by the name states is, is a guide. That's where we we put together technical knowledge to, to coach whoever, the suppliers, end users, on how to actually, what does transformer impulse test mean? Not the pass and fail criteria, that will be in the standards, okay? This is just a guide and some good technical knowledge sharing, that's all that information can be found in C5798. If you look at C57113, it's a guide for partial discharge measurements in liquid fuel power transformers and shunt reactors. So within this guide, you will find very good technical information about what partial discharge test is, how do we measure it and, and for liquid fuel transformers and shunt reactors. What, how do we set it up? What do we do? What are the critical aspects of partial discharge measurements on liquid fuel transforms? Next one, C57127 C57 is the guide, again, for detection of acoustic emissions from partial discharge in oil immersed power transforms. So now you may say, okay, I want to learn about partial discharge measurements. So just to learn about the partial discharge measurements and how to perform that test and all, you open up C57113. But then for those of you who hear or heard or know about acoustics measurements, what does that mean? What does acoustics measurements mean? Because if a transformer, we are doing partial discharge tests and we have say high PD, partial discharge on the transformer, then there are instruments, there are technology that we can actually mount these acoustics very high quality uh, hearing devices in a way uh, on the tanks of the transformers where it allows us to find the depth of where that sound is and by doing triangulation method we can actually determine generally the area of where this partial discharge is coming because think about what's partial discharge we used to call this corona also so it's actually a it's actually a discharge at very very low voltages back in the days when we used to do riv tests we would measure them with uh, by microvolts of course with partial discharge we are measuring with pico coulombs so one method measures it from voltage perspective the other measures from current perspective so pico micro these are very low so when the unit the transformer has high partial discharge for us it's pretty much looking for a needle in a haystack. So this acoustic emission method allows us to at least, imagine you're working on a two, 300 MEA transformer, 345 KV. 
big unit. We have PD. Okay, we can eliminate bushings, this and that, but then, then you have this giant box and you have PD. Where is this coming from? So C57-127 helps us as a guide how to use and how to, how to actually uh, use the data coming from the acoustics, how to actually use the acoustics devices. C57-138 is a recommended practice for routine impulse tests for distribution transformers. So now, just to clarify, there is guide, there is recommended practice, and then you will see there's standards, okay? So recommended practice is pretty much, as the name states, it's the recommended practice on how to do routine impulse tests for distribution transforms. So impulse tests, Lyling impulse tests for uh, power transformers versus distribution transformers are different. So you can find the distribution transformers under this recommended practice C57138. Under C57160, it's again a guide for PD measurements in high voltage bushings and instrument transformers. So one may ask now, say, Hakan, how come this is not under the bushing subcommittee? Because this is test. And testing, as the scope states, is under voltage test, is under dielectric subcommittee not necessarily the design aspects and all that under the bushing subcommittee. So that's where you can find the guide under C57-160 on measurements of high voltage bushings. 161, this is a really amazing guide for DFR. What is DFR? Dielectric Frequency Response Analysis. Measurement, so IEEE Transformers Committee has written a very good detailed guide on how to do that test, what to look for, how to interpret the DFR test results. 168, guide for low frequency dielectric testing for distribution power and regulating transformers. Okay, so the difference here, there's different guide for distribution transformers in pulse tests and power transformers in pulse tests. However, low frequency dielectric tests, as an example, applied potential test or high pot test is actually covered under C57-168. Once again, this is a guide. Now, C57-1290, there's two C57-1290s, okay? This one says continuous revision of low frequency test, okay? And this one says continuous revision of impulse test, okay? Now, when we go to performance characteristics subcommittee, you're going to see another C57-1290 task force where it's the continuous. And at the end of the presentation, you will we'll talk about the scope of what standard subcommittee do. So C57-1290 obviously by itself is one of the most commonly used standards that's continuous excuse me, uh, it's the test code for power and regulators and uh, shunt reactors. So it's a big uh, test uh, standard. However, within that, there are so many different tests. Some of the tests, as you can see, we have task forces. What does a task force do? Task force actually works on smaller portions. Members and guests get together. And we work on revising these standards, updating them, and we give it back to the working group or and the subcommittee. So when we get to performance characteristics subcommittee, you will see that there's going to be another C57-1290, actually more than one, okay? So for those of you who may say, okay, so am I going to go find a C57-1290 standard for that? No. You will find and you can purchase C57 to F9 all by itself. All these test forces, we have those portions that we work on that feeds into C57 to F90. Some comes from the dielectric subcommittee, some comes from uh, performance characteristics, oil, some comes from insulation life subcommittee, 
all the, that work that we do finally goes to C57-1290 standard, okay? 12200 is the entity value, and then there's some other test forces you can see here. For example, uh, we, we started working on investigative interaction between substation transients and transformers in HV and EHV transients. We have a test force working on factory partial discharge limits. For those of you who know, it used to be 500 picocoulombs, now it's 250 picocoulombs. So there is actually a task force gets created that focuses on with you know small or big groups that they work on what do we what should the limits be? Is 500 good? Should we keep it that way? Then the vote comes out and says, yeah, 500 good or not. And then it goes to the working group and the subcommittee and it gets voted at the subcommittee and then subcommittee may actually reject it back and then comes back to task force. Or subcommittee may say, okay, you've done everything, it passes the subcommittee as well, then, then you have a new standard on the partial discharge limits. This is how the IEEE Transformers Committee works. Performance Characteristics Subcommittee. The scope of this subcommittee is to study and review the treatment of loss, impedance, exciting current, inrush current, and other performance characteristics and their methods of application, measurement, or test for liquid field transformers and reactors. We develop and maintain the related standards and recommended practices and guides for such criteria and coordinate with other technical committees, groups, societies, and associates. So performance characteristics works on the standards, the guides, and everything else that really applies to the performance of the transformer where the losses, impedances, exciting currents, inrush currents, and others. What are the children groups under that? C57-1200, another, another standard that's widely used within our industry. Of course, every one of them is widely used, but it seems like 1200, 1210, and 1290 is the most, one of the most common ones. So what does 1200 do? Now, this is 1200 task force. It is continuous task force under performance characteristics. 1200 task force, standards, general requirements for liquid emissions, general requirements, distribution power and regulating transformers. So 1200 task force works on the general requirements for these transformers. And they meet, work, come up with revisions, and take it back to performance characteristics and also the standards group. 1290, continuous revision on IEEE standard test code for liquid. So this one is the continuous revision for the actually C57-1290 that is not covered for, with other subcommittees. That's the one that I chair, and that's the one that we work on everything else that other subcommittees don't work. But then when you look at, here you have another one, C57-1290 C task force, that's continuous revision, only section 13, sound level measurements. Because it's such a critical aspect, just like everything else, but we actually have a continuous, a task force that, work, task force that works on continuous revisions to just section 13. So you will actually see one or two more C57-1290 is coming. But, but for, for those of you who actually use C57-1290, when do you use C57-1290? Well, you can use C57-1290 when you're writing your specifications. You definitely use it when you are looking at certified test reports. We use it every day when we are testing our transformers in our plants. You can use it when you go witness the test. And 1290 by itself has all these tests connected. The task forces feed into the standards of C57-1290. Where can you find information about application of transformer connections? Okay. 
you're new to the industry, you want to learn about what the standards are for a, uh, transformer connections in three-phase distribution systems, then you'll be looking for C57105. What would you find in C57109? That is a guide. Once again, pay attention to the difference between guide versus standards or recommended practice. This guide, 109, is for liquid immersed transformers through fault current durations. Very important topic, one of the number one killers of transformers, right? Through faults in the field. So where can you get standardized guide is under C57109. Then you can see there are some task forces. There's actually a group working as a task force just to work on core gassing and grounding. There is a task force working on, works on LTC diagnostics guide. What can you find under C57110? It's a recommended practice for establishing transformer capability when supplying non-sinusoidal -sinus, uh, load currents. Under 120, it's the loss evaluation guide for power transformers and reactors. So once again, loss evaluation, another critical, uh, you know, especially the end users. This is a guide that a lot of our customers and we also use to, to understand and to get a guide on loss evaluation. 123, guide for transformer loss measurements. Now this is in the plants, factories. It's a guide that we follow on how to measure losses in transformers. Here comes another one. If you're buying a transformer and you want short circuit tests to be done, which is you know, very rarely, but yes, you know, we have laboratory in our country that we can ship our transformers to get the short circuit done. Here is the guide. 133 for short circuit testing of distribution and power transformers. 136, guide for audible sound of liquid image uh, power transformers. Now I want to connect these two points. You're seeing here, 133 is a guide, uh, excuse me, 136 is a guide for audible sound of liquid immersion. What is the difference between that and section 13 under 1290? Well, this one is a guide by itself for sound levels. That one is a standard. Okay? And one last is 149 where you can find the guide for the application and interpretation of frequency response analysis once again, remember slide before, under dielectric tests, subcommittee, not performance corrective subcommittee, we had a task force that worked on the DFR test. Now under performance, we have a guide for the application and interpretation of the DFR test. And there's actually more under performance subcommittees that I didn't put here, but you can, you can find these in the IEEE Transformers Committee website. The, the website is open to anybody. It's pretty much IEEE Transformers.com. You can go in there, you can click on subcommittees, you can see all these, okay? Insulation subcommittee, insulation life subcommittee. What is the scope of this subcommittee? The scope of this subcommittee is to study and review methods to determine maximum safe insulation temperatures, ambient temperatures, insulation aging characteristics, safe duration of loads in excess of nameplate, including short circuits, and also to determine methods of calculating and measuring temperatures reached during both transient and steady state loads. Another very critical, every subcommittee is of course very critical, uh, very valuable, but this one studies, focuses with all inputs coming to it, how we can truly, I say, control the life of the transformer by focusing to the life of insulation, okay? So what are the children working groups and task forces under that? C5791, is the guide for loading mineral oil immersed transformers. Here's your loading guide. I'm sure most of you heard. What is the loading guide? 
C5791. And that guy talks about the uh, loading of transformers in comparison to the ambient temperatures and many other aspects. C57100, it's a standard test procedure for thermal evaluation of liquid immersed transformers and power transformers. So now one may ask, this is testing. Why is it not under performance characteristics? Okay, well, because this portion, C57, this standard test procedure is because it's related to the insulation life, it is covered under insulation life subcommittee. 119, recommended practice. Once again, this is a very good example here. You're seeing guide, standard, test procedure, and recommended practice, three different things, okay? 119 is a recommended practice for performing temperature rise tests on oil immersed power transformers at loads beyond nameplate ratings. Now, what's the difference between 100 and 119? This is just standard test procedure for thermal evaluation. This one is beyond the nameplate ratings. So if you are specifying a transformer with overload conditions, or different ambience or whatever, you can find the recommended practice under 119. 145 is the guide for definition of thermal duplicate liquid immersed, immersed distribution power and regulating transforms. So let me talk a little bit about what does thermal duplicate means. Uh, of course, the duplicate just by itself means duplicate. So if you order two identical units, one to the other are duplicate transformers. Everything about those transformers will be exactly the same. The, the cabling, the, the conductor that we use in the windings, the insulation, the radiators, and all that. What is thermal duplicate? Does that mean that those transformers has to be identical? No, not necessarily. In a nutshell, thermal duplicate definition and guide for the definition lets us look at the total loss that we need to dissipate the heat. That's pretty much how the transformer cooling calculation starts with. It's not that simple, but that's very high level. That's how it starts with. You calculate your total losses, which is energy being dissipated as heat, which is the loss in transformers mainly coming from your windings, your core, and some other stray losses, tanks and brackets and whatnot. So this guide helps us defining how we can work on what, how do we find a thermal duplicate? Why is it important? It's important for manufacturers from this perspective when we are designing a transformer, if we have done a similar design before, then we pull that design so we can look at how did we design it and how was the test results. Obviously, it's archived now, so it must have been all good. So then this new design, we say, okay, I have done a design like this before and it's thermally duplicate. So we look at the current density in the conductor, we look at the radiators, the total space on the radiators that dissipates the heat, the fans, and whatever else. The motors, the pumps, depend on the design of the transformer. 169 is the guide for determination of maximum winding temperature rise in liquid immersed transformers. Once again, maximum winding temperature rise is, is a critical aspect. So you have average winding rise, oil rise and everything else, then we have to be very careful with the hottest spot or hot spot rise. Because if your overall cooling seems to be okay in a transformer, life may not be that great. You may still have hot spots in the winding or even hot spots in the leads. Don't forget the leads, please, okay? The leads is like, like your tires on your car. If your tire is in a bad shape, it doesn't matter how great your car is, that tire will blow up. So we use this guide to determine, to help us determine how to 
calculate and estimate and measure our maximum winding temperature rises. And of course, there's a task force works on clause 11 now, temperature rise. And another task force, 1200, just looks at that one clause, that one little clause. Little, but it's very critical. Because of that, Transformers Committee decided to have a task force to just look at 5.11.1.14, rises of metallic parts of uh, parts other than windings. Once again, transformers work with mutual coupling of electromagnetic forces. And when you have all that electromagnetic forces in that tank, talking about liquid field transformers here, you have metal parts in there. The tank itself is metal. You have brackets that are metal. You have bolts and nuts and whatnots, right? So all those metallic parts will try to get or will be within the magnetic field. So it's from the basic circuit theory that we have when it comes to electromagnetic force, you have electromagnetic field and you have metallic part. Yeah, chances are you're going to have magnetic forces. So this task force works on that. Whatever comes out of this feeds the subcommittee and then the standards, which 1200 is actually covered under standards, which we will discuss shortly coming up. Power Transformer Subcommittee. The scope of this subcommittee is to study and review engineering aspects of liquid fueled power transformers, including transmission transformers, primary unit substation transformers, generator step-up transformers, phase angle regulating transformers, and related products. What's under the power uh, transformer subcommittee? 5793, guide for installation and maintenance of liquid immersed power transformers. Here we go. Now we are getting into the installation part. Where can I find how where can I find a guide to to tell me the basic aspects and critical aspects of installation and maintenance of the transformers? There you go. C5793. 116. Guide for transformers directly connected to generators. 117 is a guide for reporting failure data for power transformers and shunt reactors on electric utility systems. Now pay attention difference between 117 and 125. 125 is the guide for failure investigation, documentation, analysis, and reporting. This one is reporting the failure data, guide for it, and this one is investigation, documentation, analysis. 131, standard performance requirements and test methods for tap changers. Let's not forget about our tap changers, right? So where can you find, here it is, 140. It's a guide for evaluation and reconditioning of liquid power transformers. So you have all transformers in your, in, in your substations, in your fleet, and then you want, to, you want to have an IEEE standard guide on how to evaluate and recondition CF57140. 143 is the guide for application of monitoring to uh, liquid immersed transformers and components. It's a guide for monitoring. 148 is the standard for control cabinets for power transformers. So maybe some of you did not know, but there is actually a standard for control cabinets, C57148. And 170 is the condition assessment of transformers. Standard subcommittee. This one is a little bigger sentences here. The scope is standard subcommittee is responsible for cognizance of current status of standards sponsored by the subcommittee. Coordination of the revision work of base standards by maintaining a list of requested changes and assigning them to the appropriate technical subcommittees. So one of the uh, task force, let's say uh, C571290 that I chair, when our task force finishes the work through performance characteristics, then it goes to standard subcommittee because because I'm having technical difficulties here. I might have locked up. Uh, 
Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it here. That's a good thing about having this live, right? So you can see when something doesn't go right. Yeah, thank you. And so if you look at this, the high level ones, okay? Now let's talk about C57 to F90, okay? Continuous revision working group. So we had so many C57 to F90 as you saw, right? Throughout this presentation. So what does this mean now? What's the difference between C57 to F90 task force versus working group? All these task forces that work on these, even one clause or continuous revision or whatnots, we all do what we have to do, then feed it through our subcommittees to the standard subcommittee so that this working group is responsible for the complete C57 to F90. This working group under standards is responsible for the complete 1200. Like I said, I repeat myself, so many task forces, working groups, and everything else feeds into making this. C57-152 is the guide for diagnostics, field testing of power apparatus. So those are the basic ones, okay? So that was my last slide. Uh, before I go to the next slide, I wanna ask my team here, is, are there any questions or comments? Why isn't there a limit for the enhanced portion of the PD test? Uh, because we are actually working on that one right now. We are thinking about putting a limit to the enhanced level one. Uh, at this moment, there isn't, but it's coming up that we are, we are thinking about putting a limit to the enhanced section as well. Why is there not one? Because that is really not the condition that the transformer is gonna see continuously in the field. That will be the answer. But we are working on, uh, on a number for the enhanced level as well. Any other questions? Uh, repeat the questions as well. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The, the, the question, you, thanks, Andrew. The, question, the first question was, why is there not a, a limit for the enhanced level during partial discharge test? And I answered that. <clears throat> In the past for low side OLTC, we have specified 16 or 5 eighths percent step up from normal voltage and 16 5 eighths step down below it. However, certain vacuum operated OLTC manufacturers are pointing out that the low side step down is less important in the US electrical power system. It appears to be a means of saving material costs for new transformers, but may have serious consequences if the lower step downs is needed. Is there an ANS, an American national standard that covers this recommendation for virtually omitting the low side step down points? Okay, uh, it is a long question and the answer may be actually long and I only have, uh, seven, eight minutes left because I have to run to another meeting. So what I'm going to request uh, who, uh, this customer to email me directly this question, which I will share my email address in a minute, uh, and let's stay in touch and I'll answer that question separately. Okay. Uh, if there are any more questions, anybody, please welcome. And here you can always, for further questions, you can email it to marketing at vatransformer.com or you're very welcome to email me directly hakan.sahin at gatransformer.com and I'll be more than happy to answer. If I cannot answer, we'll find somebody who can. Uh, and also for, your, for, for a copy of this presentation, uh, please email marketing and uh, our team will email you the presentation. Uh, and also uh, copy, 
copy of uh, the certificate that you get from our company. Andrew, is there another question? Yep. Okay. Why is there a limit for variation in pushing C2 capacitance? Okay. Capacitance? Yes. Uh, bushing C2 capacitance, actually, uh, bushing manufacturers have really good literatures on that, and I think they are available uh, for public use as well. Uh, what I will do, uh, this person, please email me, and I'll share some white papers on that one that explains exactly why C2 capacitance is not 100% guaranteed. C1 is guaranteed, but C2 is not. I'll, I'll, I'll share with you the white paper. It's available publicly anyway. All right. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining today. And we are always here for you, for our customers and whoever. Uh, please don't hesitate to email us. And thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you.